We welcome you to church. You don't hear me? Certainly you hear me. Okay. <laughs> Good morning. Please stand with us and we'll get started here in our service as we go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we are grateful this morning. We stand before you, loving you, and knowing that is because you have first loved us. Lord, we thank you for your grace and your mercy that you have channeled through Christ. We can thank you that we get to acknowledge you as our God and our creator in this land of freedom where we have the, the choice each week to come and to worship you. Lord, as we lift up praises to you this morning, we pray that it will truly be edifying to the body as we're bringing glory to you. And we just thank you that this is your opportunity in us today. In Jesus' name, amen. <coughs> Holy, 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 holy. 
please take a seat. It. And uh, today we are going to be returning to some things of normalcy. One is we're going to pass the plate today. And uh, so if you would take that welcome card and drop that in the plate, we would appreciate that very much. Um, just to have a record of your visit. If you would, go ahead and take out your uh, prayer sheet. And uh, we want to remind you of some prayer requests uh, that, we, that we have. And uh, the first one actually happened uh, a little later in the week, so we didn't get it on here. But uh, most important is this. Uh, Marilyn Oburn uh, has been out at Hardin Hills for several years. And uh, this week, uh, Thursday, she was put on hospice. And so she probably does not have long before she meets her Savior face to face. And uh, so be in prayer for her and for the family during this time. Um, also, uh, Remember our senior adults, uh, senior adult of the week this week is Gene Oates. Um, remember to pray for him. And if you'd like to send a card or a note to encourage him and let him know that he is cared for, that would be great. Um, it is also great. We also uh, use this time for our praises. It's great to have Mr. and Mrs. Mansfield back with us. <laughs> <laughs> Great to see you guys back and all right. And then we have those who we're expecting to be Mr. and Mrs. who we're waiting for. And so uh, we praise the Lord for that. Um, also, this is not in there. I want to, this is more personal, but uh, this week, a uh, week from today, 3.30, we'll be gathering here and taking some kids off to camp. And Truth for Youth Camp will be gone for a week. And I would ask you to pray for that week. Um, this uh, is going to be a, a new experience. It's going to be a little different, and uh, it's a new camp. And so just pray for us as we do that, and that this would be a week where the kids would really be able to meet with God, and God would work in their lives and draw them to himself, and uh, that we could uh, see them impacted for eternity during this time. And uh, finally then, uh, don't forget our missionaries and Pastor Yosef. Uh, Pastor Yosef is going great guns. Uh, he has five church plants that he is working in, and uh, the Lord has just opened the doors for ministry for him. So pray for him. Pray for the hearts of the gypsies in Romania that he works with, that God would uh, really do a work there, opening their hearts to salvation, and then growing them as they are people who are used to moving. They're not used to stability and growing and, and being uh, somewhere for a long time, and that God would do that and establish churches there. You'll hear more on that in the near future, but uh, the Lord is really working in that, and so just pray for Pastor Yosef and the churches that he is planting there in Romania. Yes, Pam. Okay, that would be Marty Miller. Did I hear that right? Okay. A retired vet from here has a brain bleed. So let's pray for him as well and Vicki and the Lord's just leading in comfort there. Let's go to prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we can come before you and that we can offer our praises and our prayer requests. And Lord, first off, we want to come into your gates with thanksgiving. And we want to thank you for first of all, for salvation that is available through the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. The fact that he paid the price that we could not pay. And through that, that we could be reconciled with you, God. We thank you for that. And Lord, we pray for Marilyn Oborn. We pray that you will be her strength and her, her comfort now. We pray that you would be the same for her family, that you would carry them on your wings during this time. 
And uh, Lord, we pray for Gene Oates, as uh, Lord, he is also struggling physically, and uh, that you would be with he and Sharon, that you would carry them this day and through this week, and that they might have special times with you. And Lord, we pray for Pastor Yossi. And Lord, as he has so much ministry that he can do, and Lord, with these five churches, we pray that you will help him to use his time well, give him the time he needs for that ministry, but also, Lord, for his family. And we lift them up because he is a busy man, and that, Lord, he would have those times of refreshment and times of enjoyment with the family, even in the midst of such a busy time. And we pray that you would establish these churches, that you would grow these churches, Lord, that these Romanian people, these gypsies, would become strong in Christ. And that, Lord, the community around would see that and recognize that, and you would be lifted up in that. And they would be encouraged to say, I don't know what's happened in this community, but it's pretty neat, and I want to find out what that is. And that they might discover Jesus Christ for themselves. Lord, we pray for Marty Miller with this brain bleed. Pray you'll give the doctor skill and wisdom in figuring out what to do and how to do it best. Uh, Lord, we pray for Vicki, his wife, that you would be her comfort. Lord, that she would draw close to you. And that, Lord, you would be glorified in this situation. And, Lord, we pray for uh, the camp. And as we go, Lord, that this would be a special time of communion with you for the kids that, Lord, this would be a time that is not just a time of getting away to going and having fun, but instead would be a time in which you are working in their hearts, that their hearts would be soft, that they would accept your word, and that they would grow in you, and that, Lord, there may be fruit of this that would go to eternity. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we are going to have an offering now. Uh, we are actually going to have a double offering. The first is our normal tithes and offerings. The second will be to help out with the expenses of camp for those who are sending kids. And so we will pass the plate twice. The second will be for a camp offering.
Please stand with us again and uh, just ask you to really sing out your confidence with your relationship with the Lord with a gratitude of heart. Good morning, church. I imagine it's been a minute since we had any Hank Williams music performed during a service. I imagine it's probably never, ever happened again before. But this isn't your usual country song. There's no dying, crying, going back down home. There's no dogs or drinking or cheating or pickup trucks. This one's about... <laughs> uh, 
This one's about waking up one day and answering God's call um, and accepting his gift of salvation. Maestro, if you please. so aimless life filled with sin I wouldn't let my dear Savior in then Jesus came like a stranger in the night praise the Lord I saw the light I saw the light I saw the light no more in darkness no more in night. Now I'm so happy, no sorrow inside. Praise, Praise the Lord, I saw the light. Just like a blind man, I wandered along. Worry. I saw the light, I saw the light, no more in darkness, no more in night, now I'm so happy, no sorrow inside, praise the Lord, I saw the Straight is the gate and narrow the way. Now I have traded the wrong for the right. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. I saw the light, I saw the light. No more in darkness, no more in night. Now I'm so happy sorrow inside. Praise, Praise the Lord, I saw the light. Praise, Praise the Lord, I saw the light. Amen. Did you see the light? Awesome. I tell you what, that was fantastic. Amen? All right. You get a little southern in us northerners, right? All right. Praise the Lord for that. Hey, turn to Acts chapter 20. No, no, the children stay put. They are staying put for one more week. Next week they start back into children's church. So uh, with it, you get me for one more week. This is just to give you greater anticipation and excitement for the fact of, thank goodness, Children's Church again. So we look forward to that. Yeah, we got kind of a busy week. We got some wedding happening this next weekend, so we look forward to that. Remember this, you will be married no matter what happens on Saturday. Got it? Doesn't matter. All you got to remember is say, I do. That's it. That part, you're done. So uh, with that, we look forward to celebrating with both uh, Dave and Beth on that exciting day for them. Uh, we've had graduation parties this past month, a month and a half. We have just partied, partied, and partied. And so we got one more to go, one more party to go. And then uh, I guess summer then can officially kick off because summer doesn't start till June 22nd. So we have been springing along uh, during this time. Isn't it good to have, uh, isn't it great to be able to have that plate passed again? 
Isn't that nice? Praise the Lord for that. Thank you, Leanne. You be excited about that. Yes. Leanne is our cheerleader regarding this. This is awesome. So uh, once again, what a blessing as we continually see things moving uh, in a positive direction. In Acts chapter 20, uh, we've been talking about a watchman, and a watchman is vigilant. I'll tell you a quick story as quick as I can about how this watchman wasn't very vigilant one day. It was clear back in probably 1998, I was taking a group of teenagers. We had a... <laughs> Remember oh so well. <laughs> Let me just go hide now. You know, the problem with this pulpit is I can't hide behind it. It's, 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 you can still see me no matter what I do. We were taking kids up uh, to the northern part of Wisconsin. And I had been a youth pastor for probably six, seven years at the time. And I thought that I would be a really ser good servant. And uh, so we had a 15-passenger van and a car uh, to take all the teens. And so I said, you know what, I'm going to take all the teens that are on Ritalin and who are just these hyped up kids. And so this will be important in just a moment, but I, we rented the car, and a lot, of like, a lot of rentals, they come with Florida plates on them. That's going to be very important to the rest of the story. So with it, we are about one hour we left from the Cleveland area, drove up to Mackinac, spent the night. Then we went across the UP. We were one hour away, and these Ritalin boys had had about enough of being in this car. And so being the good youth pastor, wanted to be, have a little fun with them, I decided that, okay, they were kind of hanging out the windows a little bit, and they were doing something across the roof as we were in really slow traffic. And I thought, I don't care. I just want to get to camp. I just need one more hour. We'll be at camp, and I'll have a week of rest from them. One of the kids crawled into the trunk because those seats, you know, that you can fold down. And I was at this point, I don't really care. The less I see of them, the better. Be in the trunk. All of a sudden, woo, 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 woo. There was nowhere to pull over. I mean, we were in this traffic. And so being a good citizen, I thought, well, I'll just turn off into this parking lot over here. Well, that's mistake number one with upper UP policeman, obviously, because he railed on me for even getting out of the way of traffic. When I put my lights on, you pull over, that's all there is. Well, then he begins to say, I got a report of reckless operation, some kids hanging out the window. Yeah. <laughs> what officer? I have no idea what you're talking about. Look at the back of my car. Well, guess who was still in the trunk when I got pulled over? You laugh. I wasn't laughing. <laughs> then he pulls out all of the luggage. He wants to know who I am, where I'm at, what I'm doing with these kids in the car with Florida plates on them. <laughs> then he gets out the luggage and he finds Ritalin. Puts them on the hood of his car. Then he finds switchblades that were purchased in Mackinac, which this watchman was not, had no clue. And he laid out not one, not two, not three, but five or six switchblades. This is a bad day for a youth pastor. <laughs> Long story short, I learned a lesson in grace, but also I learned a lesson that I needed to be a watchman, and I needed to be more vigilant. And I needed to be careful what I was doing, where I was at all times, and not to allow young people just to do whatever, even if it meant, I'm done, I'm over it. Whatever you want to do, you just do. Well, as we continue to look at a watchman today, a watchman must be vigilant. And one of the things that he does is he warns the people. Real quick, as a quick review, these are just four things that we've looked at here in Acts chapter 20. First is a good watchman. He is vigilant. 
He is vigilant over his own life. A second thing is a good watchman is prepared for the unknown. He, he doesn't know what's coming all the time. By no means can he. But yet these are qualities of a good watchman. A third thing that we looked at was that he proclaims God's counsel, not his own. And how he preached and taught the whole counsel of God, not just issues and topics that were important to him. And that's one reason why we go through an entire book of the Bible oftentimes. That way I can't get on my high horses, my issues, my topics, my passions only. I have to preach what is there in that scripture and then the next and then the next. So that you may hear the whole counsel of God and not just picking and choosing. A fourth thing about a good watchman is that he stays focused on his mission. And these were the four things that we looked at over the past two weeks. And today we are going to look at the final one, which is that he warns of the enemy's attack. So let's go to the Lord in prayer as we prepare our hearts. Our gracious God and Father, we thank you so much for your grace that is so sufficient. Your loving kindnesses and your mercies, for they are new every day. Father, I thank you for your forgiveness, and we would not be here today without your great sacrifice of your only Son, so that we might have our sins paid for, that we may have the opportunity to be set free as we put our hope and trust in you and you alone. Father, today as we look at the, this, this last part of Acts chapter 20, that we would understand just the need to be warning others, to be warning them with truth, to warn them of what may happen or could happen if they let their guard down. And Father, may we be on guard, watching ever so vigilantly. We pray this in your name. Amen. Well, as we move into this passage, again, you should hopefully are familiar with this passage as we have looked at it uh, pretty carefully but I just want to back ourselves up to verse number 29, and uh, we'll read 29 to 31 as we focus mainly on how the good watchman warns the people. Verse 29, Paul is speaking to the elders of Ephesus, and he says, For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore watch, and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. Uh, the word there in verse 31, watch, is nutheto, uh, nutheto, which basically means to admonish is what it means. It means to have a strong counsel and warning uh, regarding uh, what is happening. Uh, oftentimes, uh, we may hear the word nuthetic, which is a type of counseling that is done, and it's biblical counsel, where we give the counsel of God in our warnings to people. So as we move into this, that's kind of the, the part that we're looking at. As Paul says to these Ephesian elders, I want to warn you of what is coming when I leave. He said, I know these things are going to happen. And last week we talked about that word, I know. It means to perceive. It means to be able to, to have this uh, ability to be able to say, you know what, I know these things are going to happen. We kind of connected that to the wise men when they said, I saw the star. We saw his star. They perceived something that other people could not even perceive because they didn't look at the stars every single night. It's amazing. I shared this with you last week. When I look up at the stars, you could point out stars to me and tell me, oh, there's this, there's that, and I'd be like, I have no idea what you're talking about. There could be a new star in the sky tomorrow, and I would have no clue about it. But people who study the stars, would they know it? Oh, they look up at the sky, and it's just like they have it all memorized. And if there's something new up there, they're like, oh, wow, wait, that's new. And with the wise men, they knew and perceived that there was another star that was his star that was there. And Paul says he knew in that perception that when I leave, these savage wolves are going to come in amongst you and also from within. And so he gives this very strong warning to them. 
And he says, the attacks. Who are they going to attack? And this is where I want you really to be honed in on. Because savage wolves do not attack the strong. They attack who? The weak. They, they attack the weak is what they do. Savage wolves will come amongst us, and he says they will come from many different directions. But seldom does a wolf ever just come on, on an animal that is strong, but rather one that is weak. And what are they weak in? I want you to turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. In Ephesians chapter 4, we read about these overseers, these leaders of the church. In Ephesians chapter 4, Paul is writing to the church of Ephesus, and he says these words. Verse number 11, And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, until we come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ." First of all, he's saying here, look, I have given to the church individuals that are meant to teach, equip, and minister to the believers in that local community, in that local church. And you have them amongst you. You have uh, Craig Hauser who teaches over here. We have John Breen who teaches another group in the back. You have Pastor uh, BJ. You have myself. You've had others in this church who have taken those leadership positions to be able to teach and lead and help you understand the things of God. And those things are very important because as you receive them, then you apply them to your daily situation so that you in turn can be what Christ has called us to be as a church. And so as you take the things of God and apply them in your life, you become that light and testimony to a group of unbelievers that you have contact with. And so it's very important that as you are here, you are partaking and taking in the teachings and instructions. But look at verse 14. That we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. But the speaking, the truth in love, may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. And see, one of the things that this is meant to do is as you partake of truth, you will not be susceptible to every wind of teaching, every little thing that occurs or happens in our culture and society that would take you away from the very truth of God's word. So often people have no idea what they believe or why they believe it. And so they are very susceptible to whatever comes along. If it sounds good, I think I'll just partake of it. It sounds good, it looks good, it feels good, therefore it must be good. And before you know it, you've been taken away. For you see, people in the church cannot be weak in God's truth. If you are weak as a Christian, one of the things you will be weak in is in the Word of God. And you become susceptible, you become a prey, P-R-E-Y, to the attacks of those from without and those from within. And so, do we need to be students of God's Word? It's not just the teachers. It's not just the pastors. You must give yourself to the study of God's Word to know what your Lord and Savior says. To be able to be in that Word and to be able to draw near to those who will help instruct and guide and direct. Your pastors, your teachers, the prophets, the apostles, all of these things that he talks about, they are for your building up, for your strengthening, so that you will grow up and no longer be just simply children. I don't know how often you've heard this before, but there are times when you just don't want to grow up, do you? 
don't you wish you could kind of go back to when you were just kind of told what to do and when to do it? But at that time, did you want anybody to tell you what to do and when to do it? Isn't it amazing how we've almost like, man, it was so much easier when. We call it today, I'm adulting. Ugh, that adulting thing. You got to pay bills. You got to do this. You got to do that. Well, I'll tell you what. It's part of our maturation as believers. Let us not remain as children tossed to and fro. But he attacks those that are weak, those that are weak in God's word, but also those who are weak in unconfessed sin. Turn with me to Isaiah 59, verse 2. Isaiah 59 and verse 2. It is something that is often overlooked, but in life we are very good at covering our sin and not confessing our sin, but rather just hiding it. We'd rather, I see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil. I, I don't know that it exists, but also sometimes we live our lives with hidden sin. And we go about and think that we are strong when we really are weak in the Lord because there's something between myself and my Savior. Isaiah 59, verse number 1, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities... Your sins have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. You see, the Christian who walks around with unconfessed sin in their life, making a facade that everything is okay, but yet there is sin in my life and it's undealt with, you are susceptible to the attacks of these teachers of those that will tell you, it's okay, it's not that big a deal. Somebody else has it worse than you. And so we will walk around with unconfessed sin. We think, well, nobody knows about it. Nobody needs to know about it. And I will just keep it there. There was a man in the Old Testament by the name of Achan. He was a man that was told in the time of Joshua... And the battle of what? Jericho. In the battle of Jericho, they were told, you are not to take anything from the city. Achan, in the midst of the battle, as they saw all the the spoils of war, he saw some items that he wanted, and he took them to himself, put them back to his tent, dug a hole, and buried them right in the middle of his tent so nobody would see it. What happened as a result? The nation of Israel went on to another battle at Ai, a very small city, a very small town, and they were defeated. And Joshua was like, wait a minute, what's going on here? This doesn't make sense to me. And God says, there is sin in the camp. There was sin that was hidden from the eyes of Joshua, the leader. There was sin that was hidden from all others except for Achan and probably his family who helped hide it as well. Aren't we good about that as families, hiding our family's sin? Aren't we good about that? Well, I don't want anybody in the church to know what my kid did. He who covers his sin will not what? Prosper. You can't hide your sin of your family. And folks, we need to deal with our sin, but we come to dealing with our sin because we can do so because we have a loving and gracious God who is quick and willing to forgive. Amen? It's not meant to harm us, but rather to free us because sin that is covered becomes a burden, a heavy burden that uh, David himself, the king in Psalm 32, who spoke in his, his hiding of his sin, of his sin with Bathsheba, He said, the more I covered it, basically, my bones grew old, heavy. And so there is freedom when we actually uncover that and come to the people of God, come to God himself, because he says, call unto me and I will show you great and mighty things that thou knowest not. Come unto me, all you who are heavy laden, and I will give you what? Rest. 
He's saying, come and bring it forth. And so we as Christians, when we are trying to hide and cover our sin, folks, we are actually very weak and susceptible to the attacks of the false teachers and this tax of Satan himself. But also another area that we are weak in, if we are weak, is prayer. If we are prayerless and we are not in prayer as we ought to be, we are open for attack. We don't have to look very far. Turn with me to Mark chapter 14. Mark chapter 14. In Mark chapter 14, very, very familiar scripture. We come to the Garden of Gethsemane. In Mark chapter 14, we see these words beginning in verse 32. And again, we'll just read through them to refresh our hearts and minds as to what happened that evening. Just prior to Christ's crucifixion, Jesus would take his disciples, he would take them to the Garden of Gethsemane, where he was known to go and pray. It says, verse 32, Then they came to a place which was named Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. It's very interesting because in Luke, he tells us also that he said that they were to remain and they were to pray that they would not fall into temptation. And he took Peter, James, and John with him, began to be troubled and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch. Be vigilant. Stay on guard. He went a little farther and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. Then he came and found them, what? Sleeping. And he said to Peter, Simon, are you sleeping? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and what? Pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, he went away and prayed and spoke the same words. And when he returned, he found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy and they did not know what to answer him. Then he came the third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? It is, it is enough. The hour has come. Behold, the Son of Man is being betrayed in the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go, be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. What happened to Simon Peter and the disciples because of their prayerlessness? They were not prepared for that which was about to come. As we pray, we are seeking God to prepare us for whatever the unknown is. And he's saying, look, come to him and be in prayer. And that is for all of us as Christians. It is not easy to stay in prayer, is it? I got more things to do. I got to do this. I got to do this. I got to do this. I got to get to that. I got to get to that. And we fail time and time again to, to, to pray. And there are some of you here that prayer to you is like breathing. It is just something you naturally do. And to hear you pray. I am so thankful for my mom who prays for me. Isn't it great to know that there's somebody praying for you? You ought to. Because so often we are in prayerlessness, but someone's backing you up. Someone's got your back. And oftentimes we have Jesus himself who has our back, praying for us things that we don't even know. That he is beseeching God the Father on our behalf. But we are susceptible if we are prayerless in our lives, if we are falling asleep. And so as Paul is talking to these elders, he is warning them that there will be those savage wolves that will come, and there are things in our lives that we better be making certain that we have a part. One, be in the Word. Secondly, we need to be people who know the Word, but also that we are confessing our sin, and then also that we are in prayer. Those are basics, aren't they? I mean, think about it. What do I need to do? Read your Bible. Study your Bible. 
You need to be making certain that you don't have unconfessed sin in your life. If you do, then get it right. And then three, pray. Pretty simple, isn't it? It doesn't change. And I love this about God. His plan never changes. Diet plans change every year. Styles change every year. You know, I had to get a new jacket for this last wedding because my jacket was out of date. I didn't even know it was out of date. Until my kids say, Dad, that's old. I don't know, it fits, right? It covers. I don't like things to change. And our God, he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. His means of living has remained the same. What a wonderful blessing we have in him. Not only does a good watchman warn about the coming enemy and his attacks, but he also warns of the enemy's tactics. Go back with me to Acts chapter 20. The tactics of the enemy. There in verse number 30. Very interesting. He tells them exactly from where the attacks are going to come from. One is not surprising. The other is much more so. He says that there will be those that will come in among you, verse 29. They're coming from the outside, and they're going to try to penetrate into the flock. And so those are pretty obvious, and we have seen where attacks from the outside come to the church. And they try to persuade people with their language, with their, uh, their teachings and things like that. And, and as a church, you can see those kind of coming. But the ones that he says there in verse 30, look at this one. Also from where? Among yourselves. That, that's disturbing, isn't it? To think that you could be in this church or any church and there could be somebody within the body, within the flock, that is ready to share and go somewhere else with doctrine and truth. And they want to lead the people astray, but they're just waiting for the opportunity possibly. And you think, oh, that would never, ever happen. Beware. I never, never thought I would ever have three or four boys with Ritalin in them in my car. And that I would ever, ever, ever do the stupid that I did on that day for about a half hour. It was stupid. I'm confessing my sin, by the way. But, you know, as we consider these words about being watchful, be careful from within. And I think that's sad, and Paul himself saw that actually take place, that there would be those that would rise up within the church of Ephesus, and they would try to lead the Ephesian believers away from the teachings that Paul had taught them of the apostles and Christ. But they come in from every direction. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians Chapter 11, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, we have, um, again, words of Paul as he describes the enemy. How they are not easily seen. He says here in verse 13. For such are false apostles. So he's going to describe false apostles, those who are masquerading as. Deceitful workers, transforming, or the word disguising themselves, into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness whose end will be according to their works. 
again, Paul is saying, look out because people around you may be claiming to be Christian, or they appear to be Christian, or they may be, but yet there are false teachings and doctrines that they may lead you to believe. I have been in churches where uh, people have gotten way off base, their idea of end time things, and they become consumed with the end times to a point where now they see even the church as evil. And I remember one individual who looked at the church and basically said that any organized church, even this church, is evil, is of Satan because of these things that I see in the book of Revelation. We had to have a conversation, and it didn't go well, and they had to leave the church. Why is that? Because it's untruth. There are many things that come in and creep into the church. Today, one of the big things that creeps into the churches is the idea of psychology and self-esteem movement. My goodness, you must love yourself. And I'm saying to myself from Scripture, where does the Scripture tell you that you must love yourself? In fact, what I usually hear is, love your neighbor as yourself. We have no problem loving ourselves, do we? Think about it. Oh, I don't love myself. Think about the things you've done for yourself this past week. And you'll find out real quick, I do love myself. Because I took a shower. I combed my hair. I looked in the mirror 20 times to make sure that I looked okay. I bought myself this. I bought myself something else. Or I did this or I did that. We typically have no problem loving ourselves, do we? But yet, we fall for that idea. I, I must forgive myself as another bad teaching. I have to forgive myself. What power do you have to forgive yourself? Only God can forgive. You must accept the forgiveness as complete and full. Your forgiveness matters nothing because you have no power to forgive. Only God can forgive. That's what the Bible says. Folks, some of you may be sitting there right now and going, oh, I've never heard that before. Good, now you're hearing it. And there are things that creep into the church that we read, we hear, and we dig into, and we accept as truth. And they actually are lies, and they lead us away from the truth. They lead us away to, from Christ, and it leads us to a self-serving religion. Where we become greater and God becomes less. But they come in from every direction. Verse number 30 in Acts chapter 20, it gives us a little more description. It says, they will come in speaking perverse things. That word perverse means to twist. It's a, a word used in the Greek of a person who uh, makes a clay figure of some kind, a clay vessel. And before they put it into the kiln to fire it and make it strong, they nick it, bump it, or maybe they accidentally twist a little bit of the clay on a handle, and it goes in and it gets fired and it's permanently twisted. And so it's a perverse vessel because it, something happened before it got fired and hardened and became permanent. But it talks about these people, they will twist the scriptures. They will make them say exactly what they want them to say. And we don't have to go far. Go back to Genesis chapter 3. I say not far because it's the first book of the Bible. Go to Genesis chapter 3. And again, we use this example often. But it's so simple. The tactics of the devil and those who are false teachers have not changed. Look in Genesis chapter 3 with me. Familiar scripture. Here we have man in his perfect state, Adam and Eve. And they go to the very tree that they're told not to go to. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And who is there to meet them? Serpent himself, Satan. It says this, verse 1. Now the serpent was more 
Look at that word, cunning. Savage wolves are what? Cunning. Those that are false teachers are cunning. Where do they get that from? The serpent was what? Cunning. More cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Is that what God said? You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree in the midst of the garden, God has said you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. What exactly did God say in Genesis chapter 2, verse number 16? And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of how many trees can you eat? Every tree... In the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. You say, well, I don't see the difference. Folks, it's a twist. A twist is not major. A twist is not something that is overly obvious. A twist is just a tweak of something. Just a small tweak, just a little off. But yet if we don't get this truth, then we would say, oh, what's the big deal? It's just a little off. And I think that's where we become, it becomes dangerous. Because we look at it and say, well, it's not that big a deal. Was it a big deal for Adam and Eve? It was a big deal. Was it a big deal for you and me that Satan just tweaked it just that little bit? Do you feel the effects of that little tweak today? How many of you got up this morning and you got out of bed and the first sound you made was, ugh. You've been tweaked by that twist. Okay? Beware, for they will twist the scriptures. Verse 30 in Acts chapter 20, he says, Not only will they twist or pervert the things, but they will also draw away the disciples. The idea is pulling, uh, it's a Greek word simply uh, used for pulling a sword out of its sheath. And drawing it out, pulling it away from its protective housing. So often, this is where it becomes very, very dangerous as we are pulling or being drawn away from the protective environment of the church itself. Paul said in Romans 16, he talks about being aware of those who cause division. And offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned and received, avoid them. These people coax people into coming to their meetings. They encourage people to leave their church meetings to come to their meetings. They leave the church's teaching and join themselves to the teaching that is more desirable to them. And I think this is very important for us to understand because there are things in this world that we all, if we, if we could take a survey of everybody in this room, there are certain topics that if we said on Wednesday night we are going to teach on this topic, certain ones of you would jump at it and come while others would say, nah, I'm not really interested. Right? Some of you are, there are, there are certain things and passions that you have that if the church said, hey, we are going to meet on this, you would be there just like that. Well, that's what happens with these people. They begin to pull on your heartstrings and your passions, and they begin to focus in on those things. And those things become ever so important and consume us. 
we are here to teach how much of the counsel of God. How much of the Bible are we to teach? All of it. Not just pigeonhole things. Because when you pigeonhole things, you get drawn away from the things of God. Beware of those types of teachings that will draw you away from the faith and fellowship of God's people. And we have from within and from without, my goodness, whatever you want to hear, whatever what I want to hear, I've got this thing called a cell phone. And I could watch and listen to any podcast I want at any time. I can listen to any teacher that I want at any time. And they're not necessarily bad, but when they substitute your church, your local fellowship, and your pastors and your teachers there, something is wrong. You become susceptible to the attacks of Satan himself. Beware that we don't substitute those things for the fellowship and family of God. For years, people try to withdraw from the church. And it's kind of a thing that the longer I've been in ministry, the more I have seen this pattern again and again. Uh, nearly 30-some years ago, a little more than that, um, probably about 32, 33 years ago, uh, I knew of family that they were involved in their local church, and they decided that they could not agree with a piece, and literally folks, a piece of what they were teaching. And that became such a point of contention for them that instead of looking for another church, what they did is they decided they were going to develop their own home church. They were going to meet, and, and this group of believers began to meet, and pretty soon, it became very unhealthy. In time, it began to fall apart. In a short amount of time, other things became more important on Sunday than actually meeting. And pretty soon, even within that group, as strong as they were, guess what happened within it? A home church split. They couldn't even get along with each other. ramifications of that just kind of multiplied over the years. And I say, praise be to God, they have returned to the church because they realize this is not healthy for us. Why? Because they separated themselves from the very thing that God had ordained. Not organized, ordained. That which God had given to the believer. Your local body right here. Look around you. Look around you right now. Don't look at me. Look around. Look at, I know. Look at, like, oh, this is embarrassing. This is embarrassing. Hey, everybody, turn around and look at all the people in the back. There you go. Yay. We are here one for another. And as long as we stay together and work together, there is greater strength in this body. This is what God intends. This is what God desires is for us to meet the first of the week, to come together, to fellowship together, to study the word of God together, to pray together. This is where your strength, in a sense, on earth is made. You do not have to go it alone. You do not have to go through the difficulties of life on your own, but you must be a part of it and you must reach out into it. You must give to the body. You must give yourself one to another. And as you do, there is great strength and encouragement and help even when it is your time of need. But may we not just simply, and again, maybe I'm just getting preachy right now, but with it, folks, don't just turn to the church when you have need. Be the church when you don't have a need. Don't just come knocking on the door when you say, oh, I need help. And that's the only time we ever really see you involved in part and knitted in. Let us be knit together as a body of Christ. Will we always get along? <laughs> John, would you... I, she, uh, she's not your wife, is she? Whose woman is that? <laughs> I 
You're a delight to have in here, by the way. You are. I miss you being in here. And uh, I know you all can say, aw, isn't that nice? Brownie points, thank you. Shoot, I don't even know where I was. But may we stick together. May we be committed to one another. And Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. For this is the great, greatest commandment. And the second is like unto it, love your neighbor as yourself. As you show love one to another, you also show your love for who? For Christ. For Him. And what a better place that he, than He has given us than the local church to where we show our love one for another. And as people see our love one for another, that becomes a great witness in the community of, wow, look at the love that is amongst those people. The last thing of this whole chapter of Acts 20, and I said, I, I've got to close this Acts 20 off. I just, I guess it's because of the heart of the pastor. Um, this is why Acts 20 just speaks so loudly to me. But in verses 32, it says, So now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I have coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. Yes, you, all, you yourselves know that these hands have provided for my necessities and for those who are with me. I have shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. Very interesting, that last phrase there. You'll find that nowhere in the Gospels. But yet, Paul records it through Luke's hand that Jesus said these words. And so these are the words of Christ. It's more blessed to give than to receive. What does he say in his last bit of commendation to them before he leaves? He says this, stick to God and his word. That's what he says. Stick to it. Don't substitute this for some other material or content for teaching and preaching God's people. Do not waver on this book because it will build you up. Turn with me to 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17. Again, these are words that you probably have marked and highlighted in your Bible. If you don't, I would encourage you to do so. 2 Timothy 3, verse 16 says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Verse 17, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. I put up here on the screen, and this is just a reminder to people, if you've never really thought about it this way. But when he talks about doctrine and reproof and correction and instruction in righteousness, that's what it means. Doctrine, it tells us what is right and true. That's what doctrine does. So as you read God's word, you're reading his teaching and it's telling you this is what is right and true. You can always use it as a measuring stick for whatever issues you face, for whatever topics that come up. This is where I go to find out, is it true and right or is it false? God's word is a litmus test for that. Therefore, we must be students of the word. Reproof tells us when we are not right. We don't like that part, do we? I, how many of you enjoy it when someone tells you you're not doing right? So I see husbands and wives staring at each other right now. Oh, parents staring at their kids saying, wake up. Did you hear that? But what is reproof? It tells us when we are not right, and we need that, especially as adults. As adults, the longer we go, the more we are separated from our parents. We almost get this idea of, oh, I'm, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. But if we're in God's word, he'll reveal when we are not right. We're correction. What does correction do? Thankfully, he doesn't just tell us when we're not right, but he tells us how to get right. That's a wonderful thing, isn't it? He doesn't leave me wondering what I'm supposed to do, but rather this is what he wants me to do. And instruction in righteousness, how to stay right. 
So as we look at that, it is for what purpose? So that we may be thoroughly equipped for all the work that God wants us to do. This is something that he says at the very end of this, and I, I bring this out just as, as we preach through this. Verse number 32, not only will it build you up, but it will give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I kind of struggle with that. How, what does this mean? Because it's all connected with Paul saying, uh, I coveted no one's silver or gold. What Paul is telling them is this. Your inheritance as an overseer, an elder, as a watchman, even as a father, as a husband, you men, don't get so hung up on making money or having money. Because what is of greater value is the sanctification of those around you, of their growth and progress in the Lord. Parents, let me tell you, Men don't get hung up on being a financial provider alone for your children, for your family. But rather, you need to be invested and you need to be vested heavily into the enrichment of your children in walking with Christ because that is something that is an eternal inheritance that no one can take away. Men, as husbands and fathers, you must be concerned about your kids' attitudes, their actions, their responses. It is not mom's job to simply be the overseer of your children. For some reason, men have become absent in this part of child rearing. I'm thankful there are many men in our church who are involved. And you're concerned about their life and their walk with God. That needs to be of greater priority than the finances that you bring in. And for whatever reason, we have taken the easy way out and said, Well, I bring home the bacon and she takes care of all these other things. No. You're the main disciplinarian. You are the one who is supposed to help correct those attitudes and actions. You are the one that God has placed as the head of the home. Don't neglect the nurture of your children. May we not fall asleep as watchmen. Because when the watchman falls asleep, the enemy comes in. So men, husbands, as fathers, we are given the responsibility and oversight of our home and the walk of our family with God. At the very end, Paul meets with the elders and they embrace, they pray together, they kneel, they weep together because they know that this is the last time that they will be together. I wish that the story would simply end there and that it would end with a wonderful conclusion. But it does not because the church of Ephesus was given one more great word from the Apostle John in Revelation chapter 2. In Revelation chapter 2 verses 5 and 6 it says these words. Christ speaking, nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. Some good words, because he's all opening the door to say, Guess what? Even though you have left your first love, you can do what? Repent. I'm waiting for you to change, waiting for you to turn back to me, ready for you to once again love me first and foremost. He opens the door for that. But as watchmen, 
we must stay watching and we must be vigilant. We can't fall asleep on the job when we are one hour away from our destination. Oh, I wish I could turn the clock back on that day and I didn't have that illustration to show, share with you today. But I am so thankful for a God who, one, left me still with a job at the end of that. But also, I had to really just say, dear God, forgive me. It was a growing experience for me. It was a pride-popping moment for Pastor Craig. For you, what is it that needs to happen in your life in order for you to get back onto the wall to be the watchman that he wants you and calls you to be? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we have really taken the scripture almost like a, a wet rag and have wrung it again and again for everything that we possibly can, and yet there is so much more. Father, may we be watchmen. May we be those watchmen that remain vigilant, that warn again and again, even if people want to turn us off. But Lord, may we be watchmen that are watching your flock. We are doing it for an eternal reward, not a temporal reward. Father, that we are aimed at pleasing you and not those that we are directly even working with. But Lord, I pray for hearts to be open. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I want to say, first of all, to those of you who are, you are doing the work of a watchman, not just within the local church, but you're doing it in your home. You have a concern for your family, the people around you. You're watching out for the things that you do, the habits that you have placed in your life that God wants you to have. I want to encourage you, keep doing what you're doing. You may feel like, it's not making a difference. I'm tired. I want to quit. You're an hour away. Don't lose focus now. Watch the things that you have control of. Things and ways in which you can please God. Stay faithful. Others of you may be sitting there and you think, man, I have fallen asleep. I just have fallen asleep. I've missed it. I want you to take solace in the fact of God is calling you to say, hey, get back on the wall. Seek my forgiveness. Do the things that are right. Even if things are broken, do the things that are right. And get back on the wall. And there may be people here today, too, you don't know Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you're just saying, man, all of this just kind of went right over my head. Can't even be a watchman because you don't have the truth of Christ living within you. I would encourage you. Turn to Christ alone today for your salvation, for the forgiveness and cleansing of your sin. If you have that need or another need this morning, I would encourage you, even as we close our time off, if you feel compelled that you need to come down and just kneel here at the altar, and we don't do this very often, but you feel like you need to come before the Lord and just really solidify the fact that you just I need to get back to where I need to be with God. I need to reinstate that self myself as a watchman. 
you need to make that commitment today. I'd encourage you as we sing to come and bow before him at the altar in front of the stage and just ask God to do his work in your life. With every head bowed and every eye closed, just ask you to stand where you are. The praise and worship team as they come to the stage. Our Father, as we come to the end of the message, may it not be the end of decision making. May it not be the end of the application to our lives. But rather, may we be recommitting ourselves so that we not be vulnerable to the attack of Satan and those that would be disguised in ways that would lead us astray and draw us away from you and your people. Lord, may we see the value of the church family. May we see the value of what you've said here even today. And may we live it out. I pray this in your name. Amen. What a good way to end our time with the song Cornerstone. Is Christ your cornerstone? And if you feel the need to come and pray, I would encourage you to do so. And again, this is a private moment between you and your Savior. So let's sing together Cornerstone. As we sing this song, may the words that we are singing remind us why we must keep Christ as our focus.
as we close our time together, just a couple of announcements we want to remind you of. Parents of those who are going camping, we will be meeting here to leave for camp next Sunday at 3.30 and departing from there. So uh, keep that in mind. Also, Wednesday night, uh, Bible study has resumed, and we are doing Words of Wisdom and uh, having a great time doing that, digging into God's Word and the wisdom that He has for us today, especially in light of our world as we see it changing so fast. And so we would enjoy invite you to come Wednesday night at 6.30 to that and uh, we also have some snacks there. We cannot get together. We are Baptists. We must have food. And so we have uh, snacks as well. And we just have a great time worshiping the Lord together and growing together. So we want to invite you to come to that as well. Let's close with a word of prayer. Our Father, we thank you so much for what we have heard today. Lord, that you love us so much. And that, God, there's nothing that we have done that is too far gone, but that you love us so much to forgive us. It is simply a matter of being willing to come to you and ask for forgiveness. And your word says that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And we thank you for that. You are the God of second chances. And in some of our lives, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, God, you don't count our sins against us, but you put them as far as the east is from the west. You forgive and forgive and forgive 70 times 7. And we thank you for your grace and your mercy in that and your love. I pray that as we go this week that we will be good watchmen, that Lord, if we need to turn, that our hearts will be soft and that we will, in the meekness of wisdom, accept your word and submit ourselves to it and that we may become watchmen again, and that you will restore our relationships, our families, and our ability to be watchmen, and that as a result, people might see Christ in us and come to him. In Jesus' name, amen.